I'm just so glad we're all here together. And I wanted to start off tonight. I have a few friends up here with me. Um, and first, I want to introduce to you Lisa Chang that's here. Yes. Lisa, um, as you know, her son Brandon, her, and a team of people are going to Thailand. We wrote some letters some time ago to those orphans, if you remember, and some other cards. Um, but we wanted to take a minute and pray for Lisa and for that team. Lisa, um, what would you say to us would maybe be the thing, um, the main thing you would ask for prayer for in your time over there? Or how can we come alongside you? Um, as I was sharing with you yesterday, morning, I received a message from a missionary over there in Thailand. There was an outbreak of chickenpox among kids. Now that gave us a little worry and a little fear, just for a few seconds. And a group of us got together in Zoom meeting last night with the missionary over there. Nothing's going to shake us. We have decided, we came up with a backup plan, because we are planning to stay over there at their compound together with kids. If it causes um, more, I guess, planning that we cannot stay with them, we gonna we came up with the backup plans. Great. So we have plan A, B, C ready, but none of, like 14 of us, we all said we are going no matter what. Even the little kids, they were saying we are going. Even, <laughs> even if we're gonna have to do it virtually, whatever we need to do, we are still going. So that's a, a prayer request that I wanna ask every one of you to pray for us yeah. so that by the time we get there, the numbers of chicken pox doesn't grow. And the second thing is we have a layover on the way over there and coming back. That's like 10 hours at International Airport in Seoul, Incheon Airport. I had to pray, okay, what are we gonna do with the little kids for 10 hours? I'm thinking what a pl great place it is for us to share gospel, International Airport. We're gonna send them out groups of twos and twos, adults and kids, have them go out, engage in the world, share what they just experienced or share what they're about to do and receive their reaction. That's beautiful. I love it. You shared something with me. Maybe you can share quickly with us. Um, you guys have been doing training with the children because children are going with you. Yes. Um, and then you said something about all this training you've been doing and the, the little statement the little girl made. Oh, a girl <laughs> named Lauren. She is six years old. Six months ago, we announced we were going to go on this trip. We're getting ready, getting trained, equipped. From six months ago, the first meeting, and the last meeting we just had last Saturday at my house, packing up our last luggages and all that, towards the end of the meeting, we're praying, and she's like, hold on a second, everybody, in circle. <laughs> she's like, what are you all expecting from this mission trip? <laughs> I was like, where did this come from? <laughs> faith, faith, I love Kids it. Kids were more ready than us. Mm. I was very shocked, mm. thankful, overwhelmed with God's grace. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes we underestimate our kids, what they're capable yeah. of. They have more boldness than us. They're more determined than us. And they have more thick face than us. So when they went into like international airport, I know they're gonna proclaim gospel. Boldly, yes. yeah, <laughs> I'm yes. sure, that's yes. awesome. Thank you. Lisa, we want to pray for you. Um, would you put your hand out and let's pray over this team. Father, we thank you so much um, that you've put this team together. Lisa, Brandon, um, her son, and the rest from the youngest to the oldest. Father, thank you for the excitement and the zeal of the little six-year-old Lauren. God, and just we're asking you, as Paul prayed for boldness, we're asking you for boldness for this team. Um, to share and be light and be salt. Father, from the layover in Seoul, God, to this orphanage and as they love on the orphans and these kids. Father, we pray that the chicken pox would be eradicated, that you'd heal those precious kids that are there now that are sick. God, heal them quickly, we pray. And we pray your protection would be upon this team. Father, fill them with your spirit. God, go before them. We know that every appointment you set up so thank you, God. We pray your gospel, the news of your kingdom, and Jesus, your name, would go out, and there would be many that would believe on you and find hope and salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Lisa. All right. Yes, amen. Amen. So um, now my friend Peggy is up here, Peggy Mitrano. And yes, let's welcome Peggy. 
So Peggy, I've asked Peggy to be here with me because um, it is E, Engaging Our World. So on each letter E of Engaging Our World, we're going to introduce you to a new missionary. Um, lots of missions happening here in our body. But this um, month, we're going to introduce you to Patty Toland, who's a longtime friend of Peggy. So I've asked Peggy to come and kind of um, talk to us a little bit about what Patty is doing. Um, and so let me turn on my little thing here. Actually, it goes down. There we go. All right, there's Patty. Um, and so she's given us a few prayer points. We're going to have an opportunity this morning for a few minutes to pray for Patty. Um, if some of you remember and you were at church on a Sunday uh, last month sometime, or maybe earlier this month actually, um, she was here and was interviewed in the Sunday service. And she's going to be in the future doing some missions training here at our church, so we're super excited about that. But how long have you known um, Patty? We were we were actually trying to figure that out the other day. Do you, you know, sometimes you just know people for so long you have no clue how long you've known them. So all I can say is at least 40 years. It's a long time. We were babies precious. when we met. I love it. I love it. And so um, what's, I mean, Patty does a lot of things. She does. Yes. So what is she currently doing right now? Um, right this minute or with WEC well, yes. in general? Okay, in so general. she is with WEC, which is um, Worldwide Evangelism uh, for Christ. She has a couple of roles there. She is the international, she's over international uh, training missionaries to go into countries that have never had a missionary before. So unreached people, she does the training for them. She also does... Uh, care for all the missionaries on the field around the world, care while they're on the field, training to get them to the field, training when they re-enter their home countries, yeah. and she also internationally teaches uh, ministering and helping kids through trauma. Mm. Okay, so specifically right now, she's where? I'm going to put she the map up. She is in Mindanao, is that how you say it? Yes. You say it better mm. than me. She's mm. in Mindanao, and she is this week doing training for uh, ministering to kids with trauma and how to help them process the trauma, be healed from the trauma. And the people that she's training obviously work with kids, but what's interesting is even though it's a Christian uh, training that she's doing, probably about half of the audience that's coming for the training is, are not Christians. So they're going to be hearing about the, the training, but also hearing about the Lord, because really there's no complete yes. healing without Jesus. Yes. So uh, one of Patty's yeah. prayers is yeah. that those that are coming mm -hmm. that don't know the Lord will know the Lord by the time they yeah. leave. Amen. Amen. And so interestingly, you know, we prayed last week for the Revelos, who are also in the Philippines. If you look at the map, wait, look, I'm going to use this. Ah, the laser. Okay. <laughs> I forgot this this morning. Marinduque, did I say it right? Thank you, Jared. Marinduque is where um, the, the, the Arevalo family is, so we can still keep them in prayer. They are there currently now, and then all the way down here in Mindanao is where Patty is. Um, and then next week, she travels on to Manila, and she'll be, so she's training a team of 50 in Mindanao now. Next week in Manila, she'll be training those that are working with kids, not only that have experienced trauma, but they're also special needs, so they have some physical limitations, um, you know, compiled on top of the trauma. It was interesting, last week she was training a team that's going to be in Asia um, for prayer walks, um, and can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, they, um, if you don't know what a prayer walk is, it's exactly what it sounds like. Um, they get together and they walk and they pray. And especially when they're going into unreached countries or countries with strong, you know, um, satanic strongholds, they will walk and pray and they'll pray against the strongholds. They'll pray for the people. They'll pray everything spiritual that they have been trained to pray so that there, there is an opening in that place when they go in to preach the gospel. Mm, amen. Um, you know, I love that we get to be called into prayer. Um, Jesus calls us into prayer. And as we've come out of John, John 17 and we watched his example of prayer, today we're going to have an opportunity to pray now for Patty and this area of the world um, as well. Later today we're going to have an opportunity to pray in our groups. I also, each um, Engage Your World week, bring you an area of the world that is under persecution. And Mindanao in the Philippines is an area that is hostile. So um, 
I don't know if you remember the Burnhams, Gracia Burnham. They were held hostage there in Mindanao. Um, that's where they were from and serving. And so there are many pastors and Christians who have been killed in Mindanao um, as well because it's a, although the whole of the Philippines is primarily Christian, in Mindanao, it's primarily Muslim. And so in those Muslim areas, there are many groups that have subscribed to ISIS for financial support. And so they are driving Christians out of their areas. So we need to pray for the boldness of the believers there and for, in that dark place, the light to um, penetrate um, and eyes to be open and for salvation. So um, with that, I want to go back to my slide with Patty. Here are some prayer points. I'd love us to take a few minutes right now. You guys gather up in a few little groups. You've got some prayer points here to pray for Patty, who's in Mindanao currently, that area, persecuted Christians in that area. And let's take some time to pray, and then we'll close you out after a couple minutes, okay? Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this night. Lord, we just love you, and we pray as we open your word that you would speak to our hearts, Lord, open the eyes of our heart so that we can see, Lord, and our lives be changed. Strengthen our inner being with your power, I pray. And Lord, may this chapter and this book, as we have studied this, come alive in our own lives. Thank you, God, for all that you do for us. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. So John chapter 18, and last week you had John chapter 17, which is the Lord's Prayer, and it begins John 18, 1, when Jesus had spoken these words. Well, what he's referring to are the, is the prayer that he just prayed, and that prayer in John chapter 17 where he prayed to the Father. And in that prayer, what you get to see between the Lord Jesus Christ and his own Father, and I hope and pray as you um, finish these last chapters that it'll bring, come all together for you in your life, because what you have there between Jesus and the Father are secret treasures that he speaks to his Father. And now that he's in heaven, he's your great intercessor. That's a great intercessory prayer. So now in heaven, Jesus is your great intercessor, and he continues to pray for you even as we sit here tonight. So that's what it closes out, John chapter 17, and we get into chapter 18. When we get to chapter 18 after the prayer, we now are approaching the hour, Jesus said at the beginning of the prayer of John 17, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And his glorification would be his death, his resurrection, and then he would return to heaven, but his death in particular, because he's been telling them about this all along. And so we now come to chapter 18, and chapter 18 begins with, after he's spoken these words, and here we have him, he, and John says it this way. He says, he went out with his disciples over the book Kidron where there was a garden. Now that's all John mentions of the Garden of Gethsemane. The reason being is because John has done a factual account of Jesus' life on earth. Factual, giving you the facts and giving you the truth to prove one thing, which is in John chapter 20, and it's verse 30 and 31. And what it is, is, um, and I'll read it for you. Jesus said to them, Thomas, because you have seen me, this is 29. And uh, I'm sorry, it's John chapter um, um Oh, no, it's John chapter 20, verse 30. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that believing 
you may have life in his name. So the word there is believing. And what are we to believe? This is why he wrote the book, that he is the Christ, the, the son of the living God. And for that reason, he was put to death because he, they thought he was Jesus of Nazareth. And my question to you as we go through this is, who is he to you? Is he in your life the Christ, the son of the living God? Because if we really believe that and we keep on believing that, our lives will be different. And so that is the question. And of course, the reason he died on the cross. Now, before, before Jesus had spoken these things, he spoke, and this is one thing that I want to point out to you, because there's so much fear in people's lives today. And at the end of, it's John chapter 14, verse 27, and I'm just bringing to your remembrance some of the things that you have taught so that you can apply it all through the book of John and know that this is what's being proven in your life. The things that he said are the things that will become true in your life if you just believe. Simply believe. Because we feel, we think we can feel ourselves into faith, but that's not belief. And so he, what, what Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 27, peace also, I live, leave with you. So he gave them his gift of peace. And I'm going to read that verse for you because this is so important in your life. Um, that we can have his peace. Peace. That's the peace that passes understanding. I, myself, the Christ, the Son of the living God, leave with you. My peace. That is, the Christ, the Son of the living God, I give to you as a gift. Not as the world gives do I give unto you. I give to you, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You have heard me say to you, I am going away, and I'll come again. So the gift he gave as he was leaving was his very own peace. Now, what we have to remember is this as we take chapters 18 and 19 and we walk through his arrest, his betrayal, before the court, before Pilate. You see him in his life and the way he conducted his life was through peace. So as you look at that, remember, through all these situations, in a troubled world, with all the calamities as we hear, with all the fear that there is, many are longing for peace, and we have the Prince of Peace. He's the Christ, the Son of the living God. My very own peace I give to you. So, in a troubled and chaotic world. So he spoke of this again. And I want you to understand as we read these things that he is saying this to us as he himself is facing the agony of Gethsemane and the agony and pain and the shame of Calvary. He walks through it with the calm and the peace of heaven. You see, it is the peace of heaven. And we get a taste of that. It's a peace that passes understanding. So there's one of verse I'm going to read you because he spoke of it again twice about peace. He spoke of it in John at the end of John 16. And in verse 33, this is what he said. These things I have spoken to you. Who spoke them? The Christ, the Son of the living God, as he prepared to face his own Gethsemane. These things I have spoken to you, all what you've learned in John's gospel, the vine and the branches, when John saw him coming, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He says, he must, 
decrease, I must decrease and he must increase. And that's what needs to happen in our own individual lives. And so he says in, in, in verse um, 1633, these things I have spoken to you that in me, that is living in Christ, in the vine, as a branch, that's all we are, branches. And the fruit of the vine always comes from the root. It's the root that sustains the fruit. It gives the fruit. So we have the Holy Spirit that flows us with his very own life. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit, to give us his life. And so the way we have his life is to follow him and obey him. And so um, he says, my peace I give to you. In me, that is in living in me, you may have peace. But in the world, you will have trouble. But be of good cheer. How can you have this peace? I have overcome the world. And what we see when we get into 18 and 19 is how he conducted his life and overcame. He overcame the world at the cross. The victory was won. That's why Paul could say, thanks be unto God who gives me the victory because he won the victory in our life. So we can have his very own peace in the midst of any given circumstances. And we always have to remember it comes from him. It doesn't come from me. And so we get into chapter 18 and we've, uh, we've looked at the way he gives us his peace. And believers, I, I want you to, for the weeks before Easter, which not, are not many, take chapter 18 and 19 and read it at least twice a week in the different translations until, and read it with reverence and awe and, and, and see exactly who this is, who Christ is, and have him, look at him and who he is and what he did for you at the cross and understand who this is, that it happened to him. Let your heart realize it happened to him. That is the son of God, the son of God who came to earth and he lives now in your life through the power of the Holy Spirit. That is the Christ, the son of the living God. That, that he was the son of God was the chief accusation that they had against him. He is the son of God. And so John gave that factual account of what was going on in the days just before Christ was crucified. Christ suffered and it began in the garden of Gethsemane. And so there's a picture up there of him in the garden. And I'm gonna keep that up there. And it says in John, um, in Matthew, Matthew 26, 39, it gives us more than what we learn in John. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you, as you will. And what Jesus is teaching us there, he gave up his own will and drank the cup for you and me. And the cup was the cup of wrath that God poured upon him, which should have been poured upon us. And he drank that cup so that we could know him and go to heaven and be with him forever and ever. Eternal life only begins here. And it, and it, it is in heaven that we are headed to. That is eternal life. And so if we look at, um, go back and, and I'll read, look at Matthew because in Matthew, it says, after that, oh, my father, if this, if this cup can pass from me, away from me, not my will, I will drink it. Your will be done. Then he goes on because he asked the disciples to watch with him and pray. And so let this cup, then he came to his disciples and found them sleeping and said to them, what, could you not watch with me one hour? Can you not take perhaps a couple of hours this week with him and read through the Gospel of John 
and especially these chapters as we're heading into Easter. Could you not watch with me? Oh, no, 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 I'm sleepy. Nothing's wrong with sleeping. It's not a sin. But the flesh. He said the spirit is willing, and isn't that us? Our spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We can't stay awake, and we can't pray. And so, and that's exactly what happened to the disciples. So, and here he, he was, he's, he's praying this prayer in agony, not far away from them. Lord, may your will be done in my life. And that should be our prayer too. May your will be done in our, my life. I may not feel like it, but it has nothing to do with feelings. It has to do with what I choose to do. It says in John chapter 7, verse 17, if anyone is willing to do his will, you have to be willing to do it. You will know of the doctrine. You will know what the Bible teaches if you're willing to obey. And this is what we see Jesus do. You will know whether the teaching is from God. So obedience is the key. And so step by step, we walk with the Lord. And then the moment, the moment we stop obeying is when the revelation stops. And so... We have to remember that Jesus, he said, I will glorify the Lord in this. And we too must seek to glorify the Lord because Jesus Christ glorified the Lord when he laid down his life for us. And so he looks at the disciples and he says, he came a second time in verse 42. He went away and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. Well, he was willing to do the will of the, the Father in heaven, and that will meant that he would lay down his life for us. And so let's read a little further in John, and I'm not going to. I want you to take those verses where he goes through the arrest and everything, and um, he is, uh, in verse, I'm going to read this one part here with his betrayal. And it's in verse 18, verse 2. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, that is, where Jesus would be, because he went with him often with his disciples. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers, now look who's coming, thousands, from the chief priests and Pharisees came with their lanterns, their torches, and their weapons. In other words, they came with physical weapons. What did Jesus have? The same thing we have, spiritual weapons. And understand this, when you read this, with all this going on, with Judas betraying him, with, with the soldiers coming to arrest him, do you know to this point, the spiritual weapons, they tried to arrest him several times, but they could not because God was sovereign over it all. It was his hour. It was God's time. So remember that in your situation. Though the, those people could not put their hands on him, even at this moment, they tried to, to take him with force. But that's Satan, and there he is, trying to get Jesus because he hated it and he used Judas. And that's how often he comes and approaches us. So here we have this physical war. They're trying to take him with force. But Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, because what? He's God. He uh, went forward and said to them, whom are you seeking? So did he hide? Did he retreat? Did he go and hide behind the rock like Adam and Eve when they sinned? It's so interesting to me, just as I think about that. In one garden, sin. Now we have Jesus, the overcomer, and he moves forward. It was God in the garden that had to come looking for Adam and Eve because the moment they sinned, they went and hid. And so God came looking for them in the garden. Where are you? like God didn't know. He wanted to ne them to know where they were. They had committed sin. And you see what Satan does in our life, what he does is take God's word and just changes it. That's all he does. Has God said that? 
All through the Bible, that's all it is. And so we have the word of God, and that's what we believe. We keep believing, we keep believing, we keep obeying. And so that we see Jesus here, and he knew everything that was happening. They thought they were in control. God Almighty was in control. They couldn't touch him. They couldn't do anything to him because God was sovereign over all of this. Even with Judas, Judas, you see, all things work together for God. This was all a part of God's plan for, for him to be arrested through Judas. It was all a part of God's plan. But God was in control because he takes all, we just sang that song, God takes all things and works together for good for us. It's just like Joseph said to his brothers. He looked at him and said, as for you, you meant for evil. Your man, but as for God, he meant for good. This is in Genesis 50. Am I not in the place where God intended me to be? We often leave that part out. He says, I'm completely in God's will. The pit, the prison, and now the palace. He says, I'm in the place that God intended me to be. And understand this in your life. When God is working things out for you, his purpose is to conform you to the image of his son. For God is working for your good. And we know, and we know, and we don't guess, and we know with assurance of faith that God is working all things for good, his own purpose for those who love him, that is for those that love him and obey him, and for his own purpose. And his purpose is, it says, is to be conformed to the image of his son. And that's Romans chapter 8, verse 28 and 29. So they, they, going back to John 18, they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth, who you're seeking. So he moves forward, he says, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. I'm not just a man. See, a lot of times we look at Jesus, and you probably looked at Jesus in the Gospel of John, and we just see Jesus of Nazareth. Understand that behind Jesus is God Almighty. He is God. And so he answers them and says, I am he. I am the great I am. You're just thinking of me as Jesus, so you think you're killing a man. But actually, you can't kill God. And so they thought, be rid of him. Let's get rid of him. He's claiming to be the king of the Jews. And we know him. He's, he lives near us. He's a carpenter. He's Joseph and Mary's son. He's just a man. Let's get rid of the man. But he answers. I'm, we're seeking Jesus of Nazareth, which he was when he walked this earth. But he had, he was the son of God. And so he says, I am he, saying, I am the great I am. That's who I am. I'm sure that only made them more angry. So he says, and Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Well, I'll be. In the presence of the Almighty, they, the spiritual forces, drew back. They thought they had the weapons. They fell. And that's who is working on your behalf. So we stand strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. We do not wrestle with flesh and blood. When you fight with people, it's not flesh and blood. There are spiritual forces of darkness. The dark forces of evil in, in Ephesians chapter 6. And so we are to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his mouth. Strong where? In the Lord. And in the strength of his might, not my might. And understand, and even when you pray, understand this, that God is working on your behalf and there may be spiritual things in the heavenly places you have no idea about what God is doing. But he's always working because Jesus said in John chapter 5, my father is working and I am always working. Meaning he's always working on your behalf. He would do, watch what the Father would, would be doing, and he came from above, and that's why he could reveal the Father. He says, the Father sent me. He kept saying that to them. They didn't like that at all. Oh, the Father sent me. The Father sent. What does he mean he came from heaven? 
Well, everything we get comes from heaven. We're born from above. He came from above. We get no earthly things. It all is from above. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. And when we live in Christ, everything he gives us comes from above. He came from above. He could reveal the Father because he came from above. He could reveal the Father's love because he came from above. He was with the Father. He knew the Father. He knew the Father's love. And when you read these, understand behind all of this, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. When you sit here tonight, you have everlasting life in you. It goes on for eternity. And I always tell my ladies, why not begin to live that life now to bring eternal things into your life? It comes from above. And so what we see here happening with Jesus, he is revealing to us the power and that God was sovereign over everything. So again, Jesus says, Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he, that I am he. Three times he told them in verse eight again, if you seek me, let my men go, let them go. Well, he had prayed them. He said, not one of them would be harmed. Here is a fulfillment of scripture right here, what he had prayed. Do you believe that when you pray? That he is protecting you? I know that, like Lisa's going on a mission trip. He never leaves us or forsakes us. He never leaves us or forsakes us. And so he says, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let my let them go, and they did let them go. And this is, might be fulfilled, which he spoke. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost no one. See, the scriptures is being fulfilled, which is the same thing in your life. When you obey the word of God, and you, Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. When you feed on him, he is the bread of life. That bread is taken into your spiritual life. You take it in and assimilate it by obedience. And then that becomes a part of your own life. It's taken into your heart. Don't, don't take it in your head. I, oh, that's a wonderful thought there. That's great. That's beautiful things they're saying there in the Bible. If I alone had obeyed what I knew in my head, I don't know. By taking it into your heart, it is a, into your head. First, your mind is changed. Your mind is renewed. And then, because Paul said, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. And do not be conformed to the world. Jesus said in here, we are not of the world. The world has nothing to do with us. They can't tell us how to live. It's not a political thing like these people were trying to get uh, Jesus on a political thing. It's all spiritual. It comes from the heavenlies. It comes from heaven. And so let not your heart be troubled. Why? Because you have his peace. It comes from above into your spiritual life as you assimilate it into your life. And you feed on the Lord Jesus Christ and you obey what he says. He says, if you love me, you will obey what I say. Simple. That's the simple thing of walking with him. He says it's so simple. What you read in the Gospel of John is so factual and so, and so much truth, but it's simple. And if we just listen, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart, it says in Hebrews. And what he says in Hebrews 10, 9 also is, Lo, I've come to do your will. That's why we're here on earth, to do his will. We don't think a lot about these things. So Jesus, of course, Peter, you know, he watches this and then he takes out his, his, in verse 10, his sword to strike the priest and he cuts off the priest's servant's ear. And so, and Jesus said to him in 11, put your sword into the sheath. Peter, I know you may want to protect me or whatever, and perhaps it comes from love and you're being bold, but this is not the way we fight. We ju you just saw this with me. This is not the way we do it. Put the sword away. God's taking care of this. We've got spiritual weapons these people can't even see. And so 
the, the cup which my father has given me, shall I not drink? Don't interfere with what God is doing. Do you know, I read in Austral Chambers years ago, he says, don't pity someone or stand in the way of what God is doing in their life. Let God have his way. Isn't that so true that even like with our children, we want to spare them, poor little souls? And God could be doing something in their life and we stand there in the way. Let truth be truth. And so I want to go on oh, a little bit further and just I'll finish with this because I, in, um, with Pilate, who come down into verse 30. And Pilate, of course, he saw no, no, nothing wrong with Jesus. There was nothing he could accuse him of, but the Jews had delivered him to him because they wanted him crucified, and under their laws, they couldn't crucify him. And so, uh, so we see him with, um, with uh, Pilate, before Pilate's court. And in verse um, 29, it says, Pilate then went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, if he were not an evildoer, we would not bring him to you. Well, they had no accusation. He's just doing evil. Can you imagine going before it and saying, oh, this man is just doing evil. They could not accuse him of anything. So they didn't even answer his question to say, well, what accusation? Can you name something? He was not an evildoer. He would not have been delivered. We brought him to you. Then Pilate said to them, you take him and judge him according to your law, because they refused. So going down a little um, further, Jesus, Pilate asked him in verse 33, then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered him, you are speaking for yourself or for others. And in verse 35, Pilate answered, am I a Jew? And then he asked him, what have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom was of this world, my servants would fight. We've talked about that. So that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now my kingdom is not from here. And that's something that we have to keep remembering, that we have a kingdom within where God is to be king and rule over our lives. It's not of this world. And so Pilate, after he says that, he says, yes, I am a king, but I'm a king of another kingdom. It's otherworldly. It's not of this world. I have nothing to do with this world. I came into this world to transform this world, to transform lives, to, to, for them to be born again. And that's why we're here. We're in the, in the world, but not of the world. We don't operate. The world operates in everything that we do. And so Pilate then says to him, um, Pilate therefore said to him, are you a king then? Jesus answered, you say rightly that I'm a king. For this cause I came into the world, and for this cause I came into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth, hear that? Of his kingdom, with God ruling, in your life, will hear him. He is Lord of your life, not of the world, will listen to my voice. Everyone who is of the truth will listen to my voice, who is living in my kingdom, because the kingdom of God is within us, and he said they will know us by our love. So I ask you as we close, who is he to you? When you ask yourself that question, when you see when Jesus, I might have said this before, whenever Jesus asked questions, I asked it of myself and he asked a lot of questions. Who do men say that I am? Oh, I'd rather not answer that question, Lord. Not that one. Well, you ask that question until he becomes the Christ, the son of the living God and you live in his kingdom.
not in the kingdom of this world. And so, as you consider this question as we leave and what God has spoken to your heart, even through all the Gospel of John and the different things that you've seen um, Jesus do, remember he said, what the Father does, I do also. He's working and I'm working. So that's the way our lives are operated. And we, we have the truth. We have it right here before us tonight. It's living and active. So Father, Thank you for your word. Jesus Christ is the word that became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Lord, he glorified the Father. He, in everything that he did, in everything that he said, in all the works that he did, he glorified the Father. And Lord, as we come and we see in these chapters his supreme laying down of his life and loving us so and in glorifying the Father, Lord, we have new life, we are born again. As we sit here tonight and as we think about Easter and his death on the cross, we would not, it would not be possible to be a part of this kingdom and be heading to an eternal home where around the throne is son, son, worthy is the lamb. So Father, we just want to give you thanks and praise in Jesus' precious name.